Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for our event on the called the Challenge Within. Uh, the reason that we chose this topic is really to discuss and share ideas on re envisioning uh, the relationship between the African American Muslim community and the immigrant uh, uh, Muslim community. Uh, the recent events that took place with the killing of George Floyd uh, have sparked a lot of conversations on social media. Uh, and just in general within the Muslim community about how race relations should be and the places that we're lacking. Uh, so this is an opportunity for us to really reevaluate uh, what we think of ourselves within our community uh, and what those conversations uh, should be looking like. Uh, with us here today, we have Dr. Malik Bendelhum, who is the executive director of the Shura Council and also uh, the vice president and co-founder of Sahab Initiative. Uh, we have Dr. Hassan, who has numerous titles. He's with Isna, Yaqeen, and I don't know how many other uh, institutions, but is, is a well-known academic and researcher within our community. Uh, and we have Sister Lubna Mullah, uh, who is also now, I believe, with Yaqeen and is also uh, with Mass and, and is a well-known activist and, 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 and sheikh within the Southern California community. Uh, and we have Sister Ismihan, uh, who is the Mass PACE director, I believe, uh, and is on the ground in the San Diego area uh, organizing and leading the community uh, within that space. Uh, and we really wanted to have a diverse set uh, of voices and understandings because as we know, our community has different uh, uh, different voices and different thought patterns and, and different uh, experiences that we really wanna share and reflect on. Uh, and uh, I'd like to begin by asking the question, uh, which I believe uh, I'll start off with Dr. Hassan is asking you, what has been the history of the relationship between the immigrant uh, community and the African American community uh, within your long term uh, serving the community and understanding both dynamics from an academic perspective, but also uh, from your ex own experience. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. You know, I'm a convert, and I am African American. I that's who I am. I grew up in the black community, in fact, and. Uh, became Muslim in a an African American masjid, and that was the year 1969. I did not meet somebody, another Muslim from overseas, for the next two years, and during that time, I would say up to the 80s. African American masjids and masjids of people from overseas were totally separate. Very little contact. In the 80s, things started to uh, kind of come together. I remember Imam Jamil Al Amin came to ISNA headquarters to make a point that it's time for the African-American Muslims and the you know, immigrant Muslims to start dialoguing, to start talking. But we, we had a very important meeting here in Southern California where we brought African-American and all the other uh, national Muslim organizations to start that dialogue. In fact, we thought we came up with the California Deca Declaration that was 1991, 92. Uh, that was the culmination of those efforts in the 80s to bring the two communities closer together. But, and, and so it's been a slow process. It's been a slow process. I think Southern California has done a little better than other areas. But I would say, in general, the relationship has not led to the ideal of us being one body, one ummah, one community. We are still separate communities. Overall, the relationship is good, I think, with leadership. But when you go past leadership, secondary leadership, and then the people that attend, often active in, in the masjids, 
there is little relationship and little understanding. So basically, we as a community are still not truly that idea of one body because we don't want know one another. And this is our biggest challenge, getting to know one another, to hear our narratives, to hear our story, so that we can better come together because we have a mission and cause in this country to be the voice of righteousness and to be those who are gonna be active in upholding justice. I think to a certain extent, we are absent from the front lines and the African-American, other Muslims coming together should be a catalyst for us doing a better job of being on the front lines. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Hassan, for sharing uh, about uh, a little bit about your experience. And it's really interesting that uh, it, it happened in Southern California because, uh, <clears throat> I mean, you know, your under, I mean, for all of us, our understandings of our region being Southern California probably does not span way too much past our own lifespan. Uh, so for me to know anything that happened in Southern California in the 1980s and the 1990s, that early is just uh, beyond me because I wasn't born yet. So <laughs> it, it, was by, it was, by the way, in Orange County, some hotel in Orange County, where we filled the big ballroom with all these people from all over the country for the purpose of trying to come together. Imam Warthudi Muhammad was there. Imam Jamil Alameen was there. Wow. The big African-American Muslim leadership was there. Um, the catalyst was uh, the Orange uh, County, the Islamic Society of Orange County. They were, and many people in it, including Dr. Muzama Sadiqi, were the Catalyst. Well, I should say they paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and knowing that it was in Orange County, it was probably at the Hilton where every event is. <laughs> but that's a, that's an interesting point. You know, I mean, I was reading the other day uh, about w Imam Warthin Muhammad hosting, renting out the LA Sports Arena, uh, where he was announcing basically, I believe it was in the 1980s, where he was sharing the transition of the, that the community was going to take. And if you know anything about the LA Sports Arena, it's a huge complex. I mean, I don't even know if uh, we have had any Muslim events these days to pack a room like that. Uh, but those are those are moments that a lot of times we don't uh, reflect on. So uh, I'd like to ask Sister Lubna, do you have any thoughts around your own experiences and and uh, your own interactions within the community? Um, um so you know, reflecting on my own interactions, uh, again, we're a product of what we've been taught, where we live, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, the surroundings that you're in. And so, Panama, my, my awakening in terms of even understanding uh, that there's, um, you know, the separation, kind of unintentional, as Dr. Hassan uh, uh, mentioned, uh, between just the, the, the general um, or the immigrant, you can say, Muslim community and African-American Muslim community, uh, it, it came later in life, this this awareness and this realization. And I remember actually going to a camp, uh, MSA West Camp, I believe, his deed retreat, and uh, having coffee with um, Imam Jihad, Jihad Safir. And, uh, you know, we had some time waiting for our flight. And I remember asking him, you know, what happened? You know, I, I was getting I was getting my history lesson from him and, uh, you know, understanding why there's this separation in the community. So it's very unfortunate, um, but I think, you know, in Chala, we say many events are, are kind of like a tipping point and kind of the point of no return. Um, I, 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 I take this upon myself and I say this to everybody who's listening and, and that if we take it upon ourselves as an intention individually, and we say that this is a point of no return for myself and all the other actions I take going forward in terms of educating myself, my family, my community, um, everybody has an opportunity to advocate for us educating about uh, black black history in America, um, understanding you know the way that the community has grown, all understanding the struggles. If we take it upon ourselves individually, at least first, 
make that commitment, then we will not fall into this state of ghafla, the state of kind of heedlessness where we're not aware of other people's situations. Um, whether that be because of distance, because we don't live near each other, or whether it's because uh, uh, that's something more intentional, whatever the reason is, uh, this has to be that point of no return. I know that is for me. I've, uh, you know, you get busy with certain things and then, you know, uh, uh, you get motivated and you get really activated uh, uh, by certain instances. And I remember even with uh, mass, you know, we pushed um, Black Lives Matter as part of our terbiya, as part of our curriculum. Uh, but without a constant effort uh, personally and on a community level, we're going to remain in this in this state of affairs and we don't want to continue that. So that was kind of my experience. It was a slow uh, learning curve, but inshallah, um, you know, these last, alhamdulillah, these last few years, at least for me, I, I, I've learned a lot, uh, understanding our own weaknesses and our own shortcomings and understanding and lack of action. And, um, and and my big push now is on a personal and on a community level to to not let that happen again and for us to actively take steps to merge the communities and to heal not only the Muslim community, but the, you know, the, the suffering of Black Americans um, and people all over the world. It's a powerful point. Um, Sister Ismahan, do you have any thoughts on that? I think um, both Dr. Hassan and my dear sister Lubna, both uh, Sheikh uh, Lubna uh, touched upon it very beautifully. I think one of the things that we tend to forget is that the freedoms that we do enjoy, especially for um, newer immigrants um, of any background, is rested on the shoulders of the civil rights movement and the struggle of um, Black America, right? Um, and that which has been fought for for centuries and for, for a very, very long time. And we tend to forget to give credit where credit is due. Even when I work on the intersections of Islamophobia and racism, I always recognize that it's because of the actual blood, sweat, tears, and lives that have been taken that we're able to enjoy the very freedoms that are continuously being under attack in this current administration in the area that we're at right now. And then the other aspect of it that I kind of want to touch upon is understanding our sense of privilege, um, especially when it comes to immigrant communities. A lot of folks, um, I always say that not every immigrant is the refugee, um, but every refugee is kind of like an immigrant of a sort. People come to this land um, on for, for multiple different reasons, whether it's for school, whether it's for uh, economic reasons, or whatever the background is for within the immigrant community. Um, and there were folks who did not have a choice of coming here. When the slave ships arrived at the shores of the new world, um, you know, it wasn't just carrying um, 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 just random folks. There were black Muslims that were on that ship. There were African-Americans of different faiths and different backgrounds that were on that ship. So recognizing that rich history of exactly what um, America was built on and what sustained it from an economic capitalistic um, level, is a privilege that unless you are living through it, you become easier to distance yourself from it. Um, and you know, just the other component of it, and I'll end with this, is when we're talking about black liberation, when we're talking about, you know, within the African-American people always, the African-American community and the larger black community, we're always talking about the struggles without celebrating the wins and what got us here. Um, so when we're thinking about um, justice, when we're thinking about equity, subhanAllah, we know as Muslims we're meant to establish justice that Allah, just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran. But an element of that is also recognizing the ways that within our own families, within our own communities, we're perpetuating the very same things that we espouse to kind of like fight against. So there's a deep reckoning um, within um, um, non-Black Muslim communities that folks have not been comfortable to do with for, for, for a very long time. That's a, <clears throat> that is a powerful point about translating into our own families. And I think Dr. Hassan also mentioned that earlier that you know at the leadership level, there's a lot of good relations, but translating that into community is, is really... Um, the hard, the hard part. Um, so Malik, you have you have two sides to this, quite literally, that you can probably share on. Yeah. So you know, well, it, it's it's something that that I've. I mean, you know, this conversation is something that I've lived my entire life. Um, for you know, people that don't know, my mother is African American from Alabama. My father is Algerian. Um, and you know, one one thing I'm I'm very grateful for is that my my parents from from Ever since we were kids, they always made sure 
to allow us to see all of the different segments of the community. And to give you an example, every every Friday night we would be at the Riverside Masjid, which was you know more of a, a mixture of you know different um, uh, different you know people from different areas, but predominantly based. Every Saturday night we were at the Claremont Masjid, which was predominantly Arab. And every Sunday we were at the African American W.D. Muhammad community in Marina Valley. Every single week we were at all of these different communities. And, you know, being kind of, you know, in, in both arenas has always allowed me to understand that we have to, we always have to be mindful of both. And one of the biggest disservices that we do, specifically within the broader Muslim community, is that we don't understand that we are literally standing on the shoulders of the African American community and the African American Muslim community in particular, who built the institutions that we are a part of today. And I'll just to give you like practical examples, right? That I always think of. Um, we can look at, you know, in the broader sense of, of you know, leaders like Malcolm X, uh, of or you know, even more um, W. D. Muhammad, right? Leading the largest convert mass conversion. Um, to Muslims in 1976 after he took over the nation of Islam. Um, we can, you know, look at um, more recently and locally, right? We have uh, Imam Siraj Wahaj, right? This is someone who raised more funds for the Muslim community than anyone in my opinion, right? That almost every institution there is, it was every masjid was, was literally, I mean, he had a part in building it, right? Um, even more local, right here to Southern California. We have Dr. Bagby, who's, who's with us, right? Who is one of the people who laid the foundations for the Shura Council here in Southern California, right? Over 80 organizations all throughout Southern California coming together under one umbrella. The first chairman of the Shura Council of Southern California was Imam Harun Abdullah, right? African-American leader, Masjid Sharif in Long Beach, right? So we have to know, we have to understand that if it was not for the black community, the black Muslim community, especially here in Southern California, we would not be where we are. So we truly have to start, have to get to know who our brothers and sisters are, because if we don't know where we've come from, we, we're not gonna be able to go where we need to go. So it, re I, I, it really, you know, the, the point that Dr. Badby made about just getting to know one another, right? And and that's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in the Quran, right? That, that he made us into nations and tribes, why? So that we can get to know one another. So we truly and honestly, we really need to start getting to know one another. And that means understanding each other's history and the struggles that each and every one of us go through, right? Because now, alhamdulillah, more people are starting to understand, you know, the struggles that, 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 that Black Americans are going through, you know, with, for instance, with police brutality and profiling and different things. This was something that people never really thought of, never understood, thought it was over-exaggerated and whatnot. I mean, I can tell you personally, you know, I, I tell people, oh, yeah, you know, I got pulled over. You must have been doing something. Not all the time. No. I literally just got pulled over Sunday night. And for no reason. I Like the cop, you know, asked you, oh, yeah, 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 license registration. You don't have anything in the car. Can you roll down all these different things? Yeah, yeah, just uh, drive safe, go home. Like, really? You know what I mean? Like, these are things that, that now finally it's in the conversation and people are finally starting to realize. And that comes from a place of getting to know one another, hearing each other, knowing each other's story, and how all of us are going to time. <laughs> Um, um, we're continuing, Malik. No, no, go ahead. Okay. So that is that is a powerful point. Uh, just about Southern California, I think that that you made uh, by Imam Harun Abdullah. I mean, I can, if you think of Long Beach, the Mejid Sharif in Long Beach, uh, Mejid Bilal, uh, Mejid Taqwa in San Diego. I believe they all were built here in the between the 1930s and the 1960s, somewhere around that time before any other measure was here. So mm -hmm. quite literally, that, that's probably the first measure I can think of. Uh, might, be, might have been Garden Grove measure in the 1970s. So you had a good you know, 30, 40 years of activity in the Muslim community of Southern California that we, have, we don't have much conne connection to. Many of us don't even think about what that looks like. Um, and can what I add that probably 
up until the 19, late 1950s, there were as many African-American Muslims as, you know, quote, quote, immigrant Muslims. Well, it's when Johnson opens the doors to immigration from all over the world that you get such large numbers. Mm-hmm. So it's a mistake to think that kind of the ratio of, of immigrant Muslims and second generation Muslims and African Americans has always been this way. Not, not really. Mm. In, in the first Juma prayer, I, I'm from Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio. The first Juma prayer was established by First Cleveland Mosque. The first masjid that offered all five salawat in Juma was my masjid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so as everybody has said here, you know, the, the reality is that the history of African American Muslims is 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 vital and to a great extent untold story of you know the overall history of Islam in America. Mm. So that so that that comes to a critical point. So you said right after Lyndon Johnson opened up that uh, the doors for immigrants to come into the country, what right. were those initial challenges? What were the initial challenges that uh, that have begun then and and that still are, are unresolved within the community? Well, if I can just say, that my first point was that because of residential patterns and other very segregated. America, Mm. African-American Muslims and immigrant Muslims did not live in the same neighborhood for the most part from the 60s and 70s on. And as a result, they lived separate existences. And we must recognize that, um, that there's two things. One, I know from living in Egypt, I lived in Egypt uh, in the 80s, and I know that the perception of people from overseas, the Egyptians I met, was that you can't go in the black community. It's dangerous. It's, you, know, you can't trust black people. You know, that was the image. And they got it, I guess, from TV or, or whatever. So not only did they live in different areas, but immigrants were scared <laughs> to go in the black community because of this stereotype. And let's face it, many of those stereotypes exist today. Mm. And this is our challenge to root out the stereotypes, the negative stereotypes that our people have towards African Americans and the endemic racism, in other words, color consciousness Mm -hmm. that also exists in our community. As Sister Lubna said, it, it you know, uh, no more. I mean, you know, I got a message soon after all of this book, I got a message from a, a dear sister that I've worked with many projects and uh, immigrant first generation. And she said, I apologize. She said, I feel so ashamed that I have sat in many meetings and occasions where people made racist remarks and I didn't say anything. Mm. She said, no more. And so I want to repeat Sister Lubna, let's all say to ourselves, no more. We need to root this out of our community. So uh, in the the time span that you mentioned earlier with Imam Jamil and Imam Warathi Muhammad and all of the others that gathered in Orange County. Uh, what were some of the action items that, that you guys presented or talked about then that, that, that maybe have gone forward and haven't gone forward since that time period? Well, actually, they formed a national organization. This was the first unified unity organization of all the major Muslim organizations. And it was called the Islamic Shura Council. It was called the Islamic, I think, yeah, Islamic Shura Council. Southern California took it over, by the way. They they copied us, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Set the record straight. I think it was 
Economic Shield Council of North America. And, um, but, but it, it fell apart after about five years. Um, one of the projects that was floated, never realized, then floated again in the 2000s by MANA was the idea of twinning, gathering, creating a hope before, uh, between masjid. In other words, kind of coupling, you know, doing what our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did in the early years of Medina of brothering or twinning, creating a between an Ansar and a Muhajirin, a Muhajir. And so the idea was one way we can get to know one another is to twin masjids. And I must say that Orange County and uh, Masjid Ibadullah, uh, was it, Sister Lubna mentioned uh, um, Sophia, um, Ma'am Jihad. Jihad Sophia and his and his beloved father. Yeah, no, I'm thinking of his father. What, what, his father is oh, yeah. uh, Huh? Yeah, I'm Sadiq. Sadiq, yeah. Sophia Sadiq, yeah, yeah. That you know, he and his community kind of developed a relationship with Orange County. Um, and he would visit Orange County, his leadership would visit Orange County, and they would uh visit him. And so that happened for a little while and I, I think this is a good project that inshallah could be taken up and you know actually on that point um so i i also sit on the uh, united states council of muslim organizations which is like a national shura council um and we literally were just having a call yesterday on, on that particular issue and and the need that you know we need to try and bring that back um, to start, you know, pairing masajid together so that we can really, you know, get to know one another. And like you mentioned, right, it's like the muhajirun and the anthar, right, getting together. Um, so so that, that's something that, alhamdulillah, you know, we can take from the past that we can really kind of move forward with and, and see benefit in. Um, like currently we have Masjid Ibadullah and uh, Islamic Institute of Orange County that are grouped together. And, and alhamdulillah, they have a great relationship. But we should, you know, expand on that. Yeah. And by the way, in the past, I don't think we got much further than the leadership. Mm. Of course, that's the beginning point, that the leadership gets to know one another, to appreciate one another. But our goal must be to go beyond just the leadership. Mm -hmm. Second level of leadership, all the board members and, mm. and people that attend the masjid. Uh, if, if we're going to kind of really bring our hearts together. We, we need to, again, hear our narratives and understand one another. And it's, it's going to be incomplete if we just keep it, you know, just a few people at the top having that experience. No, you know, it, it needs to be much more universal in the whole community. And I, I think that is the challenge. I mean, I think... Um, you know, one of the things here at, at Sahab Initiative, as we're thinking about planning out the organization, and it's it's about to go into its 10th year now, uh, we knew from the beginning that going into a new, uh, going into an existing institution uh, and trying to bring people together and bring about that change was a little bit challenging. So from our, from our inception, we ensured that our board uh, was encompassed of the people. And then uh, building the organization, the community, it, it's been gradual, uh, but we recognize that it had to be the whole thing. It, it couldn't be just going in there and trying to change things up because there's too much of a structure barrier there. Um, but I think maybe Malik can comment on this also just at the, the Shura Council level. What have you seen as far as massage and organizations trying to, to work on this model and some of the thoughts that uh, people are trying to move into uh, at this time? Yeah, so I mean, alhamdulillah, like, like, I, like I mentioned earlier, you know, more people are finally kind of starting to realize and understand that that there is there's a lot of room for improvement right um a lot of people for instance might not have understood that there was an issue 
or a lot of people, honestly, a lot of leadership may not have ever been to an African American masjid, right? Much less, or even know that they exist, right? Um, and kind of like you had mentioned earlier, and if I remember correct, I, I was talking to Imam Wali uh, from Dan from, uh, from Masjid Tapwa in San Diego. I believe they were the first masjid in California. Uh, so like, like, it's kind of like we have so much history here in California, but we don't, we don't really know about it, unfortunately. Um, and, and, and that's that's something that we've really been talking about kind of, at, you know, on the Shura level is that we need to start having these conversations. We need to start um, really showing and making people understand, you know, of, of the, the rich history that we have here in Southern California and to start getting to know all of the different leadership that we have. Um, for, for instance, one thing, uh, and just to, to, to make the offer her, um, I mentioned earlier Imam Harun Abdullah, his wife actually, who was one of the founders of uh, Masjid Sharif, uh, passed away earlier this week, Sister Luwala Abdullah, mm -hmm. to grant her the highest level of death. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it, just to kind of point out like a little, uh, I guess a, um, how can I say this? That, that we're somewhat detached is that um, most people actually haven't even heard that she passed away, right? And that, that's just kind of indicative of how connected we are to all of these different communities, right? It, it, it's really um, a, a sad um, reality showing us that, you know what, we're not as connected as we should be. And that's something that we're really working on and trying to work on with the leadership of Mastajid, that we all need to be a lot more connected. We all truly, really need to get to know each other. We start needing to start visiting each other. We need to start doing events together, right? Um, and alhamdulillah, we've been seeing that, you know, more recently, um, with some organizations and some masajid, alhamdulillah, doing joint events together. And that's just the beginning, right? And like Dr. Bagby mentioned, yeah, it might start with the leadership, but if it doesn't if it doesn't go all the way down and actually nestle into the community, it's not going to be lasting and we're not actually going to be able to move forward. And that's what we are trying to do on the Shura level is to start, you know, with the leadership, uh, you know, getting up and then start actually planning on how we can bring our community together, our communities, our community members together to, to have not only, you know, um, events uh, like where we're talking about, you know, you know, different, uh, we're having lectures and different things like that. That's part of it, but it should be beyond that, right? We should actually socially start getting together. Right, because that that's that's when you truly and honestly see like all of these different things, right? When you go to um, you know, an ifad or something at someone's house, and then you start seeing people breaking up into those groups, right? Mm -hmm. The goal is we really have to start integrating, we really have to start, you know, getting everyone together so that when we start going to those events and when we start going to those ifad and those house parties and all of those different things. That we're not seeing all of those different divides that you know we have all everyone that kind of mesh together right and eventually that that's the goal inshallah if we hope and uh to get to mm. uh, sister Mahan, could you talk a little bit about the dynamics in san diego as far as the relationship between the two communities i know the the, the i believe the community is a little bit closer there uh within the african-american community and, uh, and the immigrant community is a little bit closer in proximity so how has that relationship been uh, closer in proximity, but also separated by a freeway. And again, that goes back to what Dr. Hassan was mentioning about mm. a lot of the redlining and gerrymandering that happens in communities mm. and really separating out, it's in essence, um, a formal yet informal way of segregating communities. We always say that, um, and I, I grew up in, in, in City Heights area in South Bay, so we have one freeway that completely divides the community. So you have Everything north of the 8 freeway is more affluent um, communities, more um, immigrant kind of communities, especially the north, the more north that you go. And then south of that um, and is more concentrated of refugee immigrant communities as well, you know, just the newer resettled um, immigrant communities as well as our African-American community, right? But that does not necessarily mean that, you know, south of the 8 is predominantly where just the black community is, is, is located is throughout the county, but it was kind of a freeway that just completely divided. So what we're seeing here in San Diego, similar to what um, Brother uh, Malik and as well as Dr. Sam mentioned overall, is this trends that we've seen overall where the segregation um, of communities leads to this kind of, um, um, I guess you can say a, a divide between communities. And uh, one thing I wanna um, bring up is the narrative change that exists 
um, especially as you think about the relationship between Black communities and immigrant communities. And I don't want to separate out between those two because there are Black immigrants in and of itself. No community is a monolith. But I remember, um, and I'll use this as an example, I remember before I went to college, I honestly have never met a Palestinian in my life. Um, so when it came to the struggles of Palestine, I wasn't aware of that. Um, and the day that I was like, hold up, subhanAllah, this is more than just ayats in the Quran, more than just the history from a historical context. I recognized that I had to do some deep learning uh, myself and unlearning what I had been taught through the history that you study in school, as well as what you see every day on national television. Um, and so I had to get out of my comfort zone and learn, right? And when it comes to understanding our uh, Black community's history and unlearning a lot of the stereotypes, seeing what we've seen in movies, what we've seen, you know, uh, the dominant discourses that exist, just like we have a zero tolerance approach when it comes to Islamophobia, when it comes to the portrayal of Muslims in general, which include the Black Muslim community, we should have a zero tolerance approach when it comes to the, 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 the depiction of our black community as thugs, as looters, as this and that, you name it, everything that you can think of. I don't wanna go through the negative connotations that which we are stereotyped in, but thinking about how oftentimes within the immigrant, um, non-black immigrant communities fall into those stereotypes, which allow themselves to be segregated even beyond just the physical and the socioeconomic um, aspect is also just from the narrative change and telling our story what we found unacceptable for our own specific cultures and for our faith, for some reason we found it acceptable when it comes to our brothers and sisters of a different skin color. Um, mm -hmm. So when I talk a lot about the unlearning and the challenges, you know, how um, until we're willing to kind of reconcile with that history and the damage that's been done and have these kind of courageous conversations, um, then as much as we put on great celebrations together, as much as we visit each other in our different masajids, mm -hmm. Um, and the different programs that folks are running, we're going to see more of a transactional relationship as opposed to the transformative kind of relationship that we see in here. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that he created us in different cultures and languages and, 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 and um, the differences so that we may get to know one another, to know one another. SubhanAllah, like the things that Allah created us to get to know each other, if we're utilizing and falling into the very system that continues to divide us, then how much are we really adhering to our Islamic tradition and our Islamic understanding of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us and the Ummah at large. So while the dynamic across the board, I feel like each each specific place has its own unique history and its own unique connections, but the same threads and the same patterns are evolving where that segregation more from a physical perspective, socioeconomic perspective, kind of like the narrative change continues to exist and thrive what we're just seeing very communities that should be working together. Like for me, I'm black, I'm Muslim, I'm a Somali refugee. Where do I fit into that narrative, right? Because all of this is within my intersections. And I think Maliki touched upon that as well, and Dr. Hassan and Sister Lubna. So how do we think, how do we reimagine um, this kind of concept of Ummah and reimagine what it means for, for, for black liberation here in, in, in the United States? Wallahu alam. Yeah, that that is a that's a challenging point. I mean, uh, the the separation exists, and and the, the challenge between the two communities. Um, uh, in your perspective, uh, what what have been some attempts that you've seen within that within the community uh, to bridge that gap? Do you think it's just been at the you know at the leadership level with the events and things, or do you feel like there's some uh, actual things people can do tangibly to to begin that transformative work? Uh, mashallah. I've seen it both from a leadership perspective. I'm also, I sit on the board of the Muslim Leadership Council, which is kind of like a mini shura council. We'll get there one day, Malik, um, inshallah. But so from a leadership perspective, there is an effort, um, not across the board, but there's an understanding of how to build kind of those transformational relationships. Um, but I think what makes it so challenging is if, you know, not coming from a perspective of charity, um, not coming from a perspective of like a savior complex when you're you know, when you're right. you know serving or interacting or building relationships within our communities because there's also that connotation that 
you know, within black communities, you know, everyone must be poor, everyone must be impoverished, everybody must be, you know, yes, there is an impact of the system on our communities overall, and we've seen the, uh, the, the disparities in our uh, the, the social inequities that exist, uh, but a component of it also is coming with a sense of humility and building those relationships, not necessarily to kind of um, have this kind of like a savior charity kind of like perspective, but really building deep meaningful relationships. So the things where I've seen it work and um, transform itself is those places where people showed up to listen, to learn even amongst the leaders and follow the lead of those who've been building and on the ground for a very, very long time. Um, and that, again, it goes back to that transformational as opposed to transactional, instead of having a checklist of like that one black friend that you can say, hey, keep pulling up in conversations like Muslims tend to do with Bilal bin Rabbah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us his status. Um, but just really going beyond showing up for each other and understanding that our liberations are tied one to, tied to one another. Excuse me, uh, uh, but I would like to ask uh, Ismahan, who comes from Somali, right? Somalia? Yes. African country, what, what is your experience, what is the experience of the Somali community when it comes to issues of race? I mean, most African Americans do not feel welcomed when they go into an immigrant masjid. I was just curious, is, is the Somali story similar? Absolutely. And I think across the board, mm -hmm. I mean, even within the Somali community, there's a lot of learning and unlearning that needs to be done. I think there's a sense of, you know, uh, um, I mean, this, uh, this goes across the board for every culture, but the closer you are to aspiring to whiteness, the more safer that you will feel. Um, and kind of like erasing that history in which we stand on. So when it comes to the Somali communities as well, I know this is a conversation that has come up numerous times, um, even if it's not from a leadership perspective, feeling welcome in non-black, non-kind of um, black communities is always a conversation that exists within the Somali community. But then I love my community, so I'm gonna turn it back on around as well, where sometimes we may not be as welcoming to our you know, African-American black communities that are not of Somali you know, uh, background. So I think when we talk about the impacts of white supremacy and the impacts of the system, across the board you know there's a lot of like there's a lot of opportunities for us to decolonize our minds and recognize that you know if I, I i get profiled my brothers get profiled you know just if a cop stops you he's not going to say what kind of black are you um you know where's your heritage from at the end of the day your skin color is your skin color um so there's a lot of inter um community and intra community efforts that need to be um dealt with and um, for us to have courageous conversation around that because the colorism exists across the board, um, uh, definitely across the board. Even for me being a black Somali refugee woman, I've seen that sometimes because I am of a lighter shade, you know, a black, then sometimes there's certain privileges that I have that someone in my family who's more darker skin doesn't have. So, you know, thinking about those conversations um, and having these open conversations is going to be critical if we're thinking about really dismantling racism, both systemically and also in our families and society. Yeah. Sister Lubna, do you, do you have any thoughts to share on that point? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, when we were talking about, all of you, mashallah, uh, talking about, uh, you know, how, how we can bridge the gap, um, I do believe that, so, you know, kind of on, on a message level, uh, in terms, so people can definitely educate themselves, you know, read books. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful resources. Alhamdulillah, uh, people like uh, Alhamdulillah, activists like Sister Smahan put together uh, at, as PACE, and a lot of other organizations have put together Muslim ARC, a lot of resources that people can um, use so that they can understand systemic racism. How does it affect so many different aspects of Black Americans, their lives in terms of healthcare, in terms of you know, getting loans, education, you know, police brutality, on and on and on and on. So that's one way I think that is very important We that everybody needs to uh, educate themselves and bring themselves up to speed. But then on a community level, I do believe, uh, and Brother Malik, we have a, uh, you know, you, you touched upon this. I do believe that has to be a deep education on uh, the board level. Um, it, not only in these uh, uh, matters of understanding race relations and understanding our history, as Dr. Sherman Jackson mentions 
in his uh, Slam in Black America course that is provided for free online by the way, mashallah by Van. I really, I'm enjoying it so much, but I love what he says. He's like, black history is American history. It's white people's history. It's brown people's history. It's immigrant history. You live in America, black history is history. It's your history. So, you know, so, so us understanding that and then understanding that everybody who takes a leadership position, it's a massive amena. And I think some people get it. And I think other people, they may have good intentions, but maybe they don't realize such a heavy amen, such a heavy trust that is upon their shoulders. Uh, my husband mentioned in, in a circle, you know, um, as an imam and as a social worker that he heard of another board member, of a board member, he's not a board member, uh, saying, you know, why should we sign this solidarity agreement for Black Lives Matter? What does it matter? That's shocking. And this is in SoCal. So this goes to, this is just you know, one comment from one person that we heard about. What about comments? So that shows you that there has to be training. You know, we can't, you know, this is kind of a bigger issue when it comes to um, message politics and leadership. But I do believe there has to be some type of kind of entry, you know, bar, you know um, training, a test for someone to even qualify to be a board member because you are representing your community. You're, you're the one who's gonna vote to build relations or not build relations. Or, and you're the one who's going to understand the impact of every single thing you do in terms of including women, including uh, you know youth, including uh, uh, all, all people that live around your masjid. And then of course, building race relations if we are segregated by, by physical distance. So I think that's something that we really need to take seriously is you know, educating our leadership and also raising the bar to entry, you know, for, for our, our masajid. Because masajid, at least on a local level, level, in my opinion, they have a big role to play. You know, when you're talking about creating brother and sisterhood type of, you know, masjid connections, um, if you're hosting a really wonderful event, wouldn't it be nice to arrange for transportation from a masjid that is separated uh, by distance and not everybody has access to that? You know, you know whoever, whoever that, that, that may be. But in particular, uh, uh, in the inner city where it's more difficult to maybe, you know, cross uh, and, and, and get to, a, um, to another masjid that maybe is more uh, immigrant, in the, um, you know, in its attendance. So, you know, that has to happen on, on a large scale, this type of understanding where we are, um, and understanding the history and understanding our biases and understanding how that plays out in the community. So that, so that leadership can take that active role at every single message level in being more inclusive. Um, and then also in making sure that Black Lives Matter as a movement, as, as, you know, as part of our Islamic history, which like you said, not tokenize only our Bilal, you know, but that understanding all other uh, different uh, Sahabi and Sahabiyats that were part of Islam from day one. Um, this type of education has to be part of the masjid all the time, understanding systemic racism, understanding racism within the Islamic community, colorism. Uh, when it comes to marriage, everybody will ask that question. Okay, you're there with your fist up in the streets, but will you uh, engage in an interracial marriage? Will you uh, entertain uh, 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 somebody qualified uh, regard, you know, regardless of the color of their skin? Um, how do we understand how language plays a barrier when we're, that was a wonderful question, Dr. Hassan, in my opinion, asking, I was asking this myself, you know, uh, between the different um, African Muslims and then black Muslims, you know, how do we view each other? How do we view ourselves? Um, so uh, uh, being able to understand all these intricacies and how does language play uh, a, a role in, in being welcoming and, and, and people understanding how it's sometimes in their own language, it's just more comfortable to drift towards people that speak your language because that's your level of comfort. And then on top of that, a cultural difference and all of that. So you know, on a community level, um, we look to organizations like Sahaba Initiative, like uh, the, the Shura Council of Southern California and some of our larger messages um, but you also want to make sure on the very, very, very local level that each uh, member of leadership, um, at least to the extent that we can, is, is held responsible and held a high level of standard and that they have to get trained, have a level of understanding so that every action they take, every lecture they decide to host, every khutbah that they push um, is something that's relevant in addressing the problems that we have today, like the situation that we're seeing in our Muslim community and in America. And let me add to Lubna's point about education. It, it should start in our Sunday schools, our Islamic schools, 
And maybe that's something that Islamic Shura Council can help in providing curricula material that will expose our kids and maybe we won't have the problem in <laughs> the next generation as much as we have in this generation. Absolutely. Yeah. And Yaqeen, you know, if I may add, uh, Dr. Hassan, you know, they, uh, you know, mashallah, as a, as a national project, provide free curriculum, which I think they just released a couple months ago, their high school curriculum, and they're always, you know, uh, high school curriculum uh, and also um, for Sunday school. And also, I believe middle school, if I'm not mistaken. And alhamdulillah, they're always uh, trying to develop and add to it issues that are relevant that, you know, that are that, like today, like what we're seeing today, racism in our own community and especially in the Muslim community. So absolutely, Dr. Hassan, those are something that need to be woven in on a very intricate level, not just way on the high level. You know, one of the <clears throat> interesting points about uh, the situation that took place with the killing of George Floyd is that there was a level of intersection that's probably uh, taking place in, in parts all across the country. That, and that's the idea of an immigrant shop owner uh, and, a, and an African-American community member. That same scenario, I believe, is taking place in many parts uh, across the world and uh, across the United States. And, you know, that's something within our own community, within our area and in, in the Inland Empire and, and San Bernardino, we see this constantly. We see this tension between uh, the relationship between uh, uh, the immigrant store owner and then the local community as a whole, because uh, for whatever perspective, for whatever reason, not many people like the immigrant shop owner most of the time. From what I've seen in, within our local community, because of the way they they treat um, the local community members. Um, but that's, I believe, that's one of the one of those hot spots. If you look at the different issues that we have, that's an area of constant interaction. Uh, on a daily basis, um, and I think that's a. We had a conversation a few a few weeks ago about how those dynamics should look, and we had a discussion with Iman that that talks about uh, helping some of those corner store stores become more inviting to the community, uh, start changing the culture, do, uh, repairing the outsides. Uh, but this was just a thought because we talked about intersection. Uh, what has been uh, some of your experiences within those within those dynamics and uh, if that's a hot spot that people are talking about, um, what are some action steps we can start there? Uh, and then we can talk a little bit about uh, at the community level and, and at the masjid level. You know, I might just chime in and say that the relationship between the immigrant store owners and the community is a large thorn in the side of African-American Muslims. It, it um, Inevitably, if you hang around long enough, you will hear them talk about the complaints they have about the local store owners. But what's, and I heard Rami Nashashibi say this of the man, but wait a minute, they should be the, the leading Dawa people of our community. They're the ones who have a relationship with people. They're the ones who are supposed to be given this beautiful image of Islam and attracting people to these ideals that this person is embodying, but it's almost just the opposite. And It's like uh, the anti-Dawah. If you look at it, yeah, it's interesting yeah. you got some Muslims doing good stuff, but then you exactly. have the vast majority of these immigrant store owners destroying yeah. the community. But, you know, so many of my African-American Muslim brothers kind of just want to diss them and almost dismiss them. I think Iman has a, a better program of kind of embracing them, working with them, helping them, trying to be a conduit, a facilitator with the community. Um, if they are open to it, I think there is, uh, you know, a chance of having a relationship whereby they can become a better model to their local community. I, I think we need to embrace them mm. and, and try to work with them. And that's what Iman is doing, uh, even in our uh, city in Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky. Some of our people, we have a community service center called SHARE, and some of our people went to Chicago and were, inshallah, that's on our action plan to embrace it. 
because we have, you know, in Lexington, it's Palestinians. I don't know who it is, you know, <laughs> but Palestinians own so many stores all over the black community. And so the idea is to try to embrace them and, and work with them to see how to improve, you know, how they come off to the community. And I, and I think that's really key because, you know, a lot of these stores are, are in, you know, areas that are extremely impoverished and they might be, you know, the only place that certain people can go, for instance, for groceries or different things of that nature. And if, you know, the store owners are treating all of these people, you know, like I remember, uh, I can't remember which Sheikh said it, but he said, you know, subhanAllah, he said we uh, as Muslims, as some, you know, we have the best product, but he said we sell it with vinegar as opposed to selling it with honey, right? Mm -hmm. In that, you know, from the second they get in, they just have the worst experience possible, right? It's just such a terrible experience. Like, hurry up, what are you doing? Well, you know, like just kind of like abrasive as opposed to, you know, if if there was a more welcoming um, relationship, right? That, you know, okay, yeah, we're here. Yes, we're a business, but we're also providing a service. We are part of the community. We want the community to rise up with us because if the community rises up with us, we all benefit, right? Um, changing kind of the understanding of, of that, you know, that relationship between the store owner and the people that are around the store, right? Not only seeing that, oh yeah, just get in, buy it and leave. No, 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 no. That, that, they're, that the store is part of the community. And if the community continues to go down, the store goes down with it, right? And really just changing that understanding, changing that relationship between those people can truly transform an area. One of one of my favorite places to go to um, is uh, Mesha Tapwa in, in New York, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Allah, what Imam Siraj has done there with his community, you see all of those store, store owners, right? All these people used to sell alcohol, you know, they got rid of all of them, right? You're not poisoning our community, right? You are part of the community. You are gonna, you are gonna be part of the solution. You're not gonna be part of the problem, right? They didn't, you know, they 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 help them reintegrate. They help them bring about positivity within the community. And I feel that's what we need to do with a lot of our store owners, right? Not come in and be like, we gotta get rid of all of you guys and all of that. No, no, no. Look, you are. You might not realize that you're doing a detriment to our community. Let's work together. To start raising the, the to elevate our community. Let's raise let's elevate each and every one of us instead of just having this one-sided relationship where it's at the detriment of one or the other. Yeah. I think the only thing I want to add to that is that exactly what you said, Brother Malik, the extractive kind of approach um, that we've become used to. And this is why I always say that, you know, especially as the community advocate and organizer, you can't separate economic justice from racial justice. And this is across the board um, because we, you know, while there's that 1% that's, you know, um, um, benefiting um, overall, now you're left with everyone who's been impacted by the system kind of reintroducing um, that extractive model of economy into communities in which it's leading to continuous harm. Um, so for us to elevate racial justice, we have got, we have to elevate economic justice as well. And when the tensions that we see is being played out in these specific communities, more yes, there's a racial component to it, but it's also the extractive model that we've been taught that we only are able to climb if we climb on the backs of others. Um, and changing that model to one of more of a community space, which is the very conversation happening when it comes to the conversation about policing right now, and comparing that to community policing, right? Um, and what does that look like? So is it is an opportunity an opportunity for us? to reimagine public safety, but also reimagine um, what our communities can look like if we were able to kind of eliminate that extractiveness that comes with, you know, operating within a capitalistic society. Mm -hmm. Wallahu yeah. And if I could add to that as well, you know, um, you know, Dr. Hassan, you touched upon a really important point when you mentioned when you're in Egypt and they say, well, don't go to the black neighborhood, it's not safe, right? So imagine when we're talking about immigrant store owners, what meant, what imagery do they have in their head? What have they been told? What are the biases that they may not understand? They themselves may very well have escaped from very terrible situations, but due to, you know, maybe due to, to the survival mode, or even if they're doing well and they're thriving, but just because of their understanding and biases that they have, if they are taught, and, and all of us want to be taught, all of us want to learn, all of us want to grow, 
But if they are taught and 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 um, you know understanding where their biases have come from, you know, and comparing it to something that they've experienced, I want to give a quick example. Uh, w one time. Um, I was about to give a talk on racism and somebody quickly rushed and told me because it was largely to a Palestinian audience. It says, uh, please make sure that you mention some of the, 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 the Arabic words that people use to refer to black people. And, mm -hmm. and, and I did not know this, but they said casually, they would say, Abdul Abid. Oh yeah, go help the Abdul over there. Suck for a lot. Suck for a lot. Terrible. And I mentioned that afterwards. Two Palestinian brothers came up to me. I'm sorry to pick on the, the brothers, but I'm just saying the Palestinian, you know, I'm just giving an example uh, that uh, they came and say, Jazak Milkhan for telling me that I did not know this was something bad. This is part of our language. We have a store and we would just refer to the customer like that. We didn't even realize. And yet you saw when, when George Floyd was murdered brutally, what were a lot of our brothers and sisters from Palestine posting? People saying all lives matter, some of our, our brothers and sisters, and showing you know, the, the, the military, Israeli military knee to the neck and saying, hey, this happens to us too. So that image was able to reach them. So, so kind of understanding, you know, individual uh, 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 owners and understanding where they're coming from, what have they been influenced by in terms of media, in terms of their culture, in terms of language, uh, uh, you know, that is detrimental to the, the way that they interact with people, uh, and namely uh, uh, Black Americans, then they can just, it can just be a very, sometimes that easy of a shift so that they will be dealing with the, the people in their community with empathy and, instead of this standoffish transactional, hey, don't, don't rest around in my store type of attitude. So, so I, I think it has to go again on that educational and, and culturally sensitive uh, type of training, inshallah. So we're, uh, we're, we're getting close to the end of the program. I do want to ask everyone, because this is all about action and commitments, if everyone can share maybe either one action item or commitment that you might be personally making uh, during this period, and you might ask others to do the same uh, in addressing the issue, and inshallah, setting deadlines and timelines. I mean, I think one of the challenges is that years will go by, and then if, you know, we want to have, like, timelines and say, by this time, we want to be reaching some certain goal within our community. And I think that's probably a good uh, place for the Sure Council to to set a timeline and say, hey, by this timeline, if our massage are not doing these certain items, we need to we need to get, I don't know what Malik does to lay the hammer <laughs> down or whatever, but but there has to be some repercussions. Uh, so inshallah, if we can talk with Dr. Hassan, if you can start there and then we'll go around. Well, one recommendation um, I have is uh, zakat sharing. There's a good model in um, Detroit and also in another city, but let's talk about Detroit just briefly. Um, they, they, in the inner city, they, they have a organization, Muslim Family Services, and the suburban masjids give zakat to that agency, and then they serve the general, basically largely African-American, but it's more than just African-Americans. It's a more poor community. And um, so that's one thing that can be um, embraced, you know, uh, zakat sharing. I was talking to a wonderful imam in one of the wealthier masjids in Detroit, suburban masjid, and he said that in his masjid, which is very uh, progressive, uh, anyway, uh, very that's dangerous in Southern California, progressive, <laughs> but uh, very open-minded. And so he said in their, both their masjid budget and in the zakat budget, they designate money towards organizations and a few masjids that they really support. And I think all of our masters that have, you know, wealth should think of how they can share that wealth with organizations, but also with masters. I, I learned that one masjid that's existed for a long time in, um, in the Crenshaw area, African-American masjid, closed. Uh, I know African American masjids are suffering all over America. I, that's what I do. I research. I'm, I'm, uh, I said research it closed me. down. Closed down. Which uh, which measure yeah. was this? Uh, it was called 
Richard Belaim and Rabah, but not, of course, the South Central one, yeah. but another one in the Crenshaw area. Mm. Anyway, um, th the point is that um, many masjid, African-American masjids really suffer and there is no reason why, I mean, we're one body, right? One body. So why not have the wealthier masjids share their wealth, but also share their humanity, you know? So anyway, that, that's my recommendation. Anyone wants to go next? Let's uh, I can just kind of, you know, go piggy, go getting right off of, you know, what, what Dr. Bagby um, was talking about. You know, one thing that we've done uh, that we've been, you know, working on at how Initiative is that, you know, we have these suburb, like specifically in the Inland Empire, um, large geographic region that um, has, you know, many just different disparities, right? You have very wealthy massages and you have, you know, massages that are in extremely low income areas that, that have a lot of need. So uh, one of the things, you know, alhamdulillah, that we, we've been doing, um, you know, one of, one of the brothers, uh, Hassan Suleiman, who kind of, you know, helped us, you know, champion this effort was to um, pair up those, those massages in the suburban area, right, that are getting all of this zakat. And, and a lot of the time, it's literally just sitting there or they may use it to remodel the bathroom, whatever it might be, right? Um, but that's not what zakat is for, right? It's supposed to be there to, to actually help people um, that could truly need it. So what we what we started to do um, through Hub Initiative was we actually started pairing up masjid, right? This is a masjid that has extreme need, and you know the, a couple of masjid that have extreme need. This is a masjid that has a surplus. Why not create a relationship that you know what? When we get, we have it, we'll send it over there, and empower them to be able to help the community that they're in, right? Just like you said, Dr. Bagby, in the you know in, in Detroit, right? Having that as part of their, uh, having that as part of their budget, right? That that's something simple that that can be done, and and it and it's not only um, it's not only to African American communities. There are other communities that are truly yeah. in need, right? the Chum mm -hmm. community, um, you know, so many massages, so many different communities that truly and honestly need that help, right? Um, and and that's something more recently that we've been trying to do with the Shura Council is you know what pair up massages. Um, that can assist one another, right? So we were talking about the twin masajid for, you know, teaming, teaming up African-American and other masajid. But another thing that we've been trying to do, um, specifically since COVID happened um, and right before Ramadan, um, where a lot of masajid truly um, rely on Ramadan to, to get all of their funding, right? That's their operational fund. They get it during Ramadan. Um, so one of the things that we we did was, you know, we... we um, partnered masajid that, you know, were in need with masajid that, for instance, might have a chunk of money that's, you know, sitting there um, that they don't necessarily need at that time and give it as a qad hasan to those other masajid, right? Give a, you know, if you can share, alhamdulillah, share as much, but at the very least, give it as a qad hasan, right? So they don't have to close down, like in the instance of a masjid Bilal in, in, in Crenshaw, right? That, that we can team up these masajid to help each other out, right? That you know what, like that part of Hassan, right? Just giving that good loan, right? Uh, that it can truly empower our community, share the wealth, share the experiences that we all have. That's something that we're we're really trying to do um, within the community, and 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 not and and something I just just last point is that sometimes and and we have this perception is that you know all of the community has to go to the African American community to show them you know all of these different things. And we, we don't really realize that, you know what? There is so much that we need to learn from the African-American community, from the black community, from, from you know, um, organizing, right? From understanding, this, you know, systematic racism. One of, you know, the most amazing things, alhamdulillah, uh, that, that I encourage every message, every organization to do, um, Imam Jihad, um, alongside, you know, Sah Academy and Sah LA, they do an amazing program on restorative justice, right? This is something that impacts every single one of them it doesn't matter who you are where you're from it impacts every single person right and especially in organizations it have to, we we all you know face it within uh, organizations and within communities and this is something that you know that that the african-american community has been working and, and and they've developed this amazing tool 
programs that all of us can really take advantage of. And that's something that each and every one of us should really take advantage of. So one thing that we we are doing is that we are trying to, you know, not only share those resources with the African-American community, but know and understand that they have so much that they could share with us that we all need to be learning from them. Um, so alhamdulillah, like before COVID, alhamdulillah, we had two of these sessions. We plan on having more of these um, throughout the year, inshallah. And it's almost like, you know, last week, uh, two weeks ago, Imam Jihad asked all the masajid to do these commitment letters, right? This commitment uh, of solidarity. And I believe, uh, I don't want to throw the numbers out there, but it might be somewhere around 40 masjids signed on to that letter saying they're going to commit to standing in solidarity with the Sly LA uh, for the issue, on the issue of police brutality uh, and, uh, some, and some some other items. But then on top of that commitment is also actionable items. That's something we need to start looking into beyond the solidarity statements and, and those efforts. Like what are commitments that we can ask everyone to do? And that's when I believe it gets challenging because people don't want to give up their Zikat money. They don't want to uh, give up their extra time and all these resources, um, which I believe is one of the challenges. But uh, uh, maybe Sister Ismahan, could you comment next on some of those action items or those tangible items you would uh, you've, you're personally committed to and you've asked uh, others to do the same. Absolutely. And I'll start off with the uh, first surah that was actually re revealed. Read, read, so read, read, read. Um, really take upon yourself. There's a lot of books available, um, a lot of different webinars that are available. Um, put the onus on yourself to educate yourself on Black liberation movement and understanding systemic racism. If you're expecting the answer and the education from a Black community, you're a few years behind, subhanAllah. So just really thinking about how one, you know, create that schedule for yourself because one reading expands the mind, changes world perspective. And Sister Lubna also referenced um, Dr. Sherman Jackson's, I think they made it available for free. And read um, Ibrahim Hamdi's book about um, being uh, racist or anti-racist. So there's multiple different avenues. There's multiple different places. Um, I know for mass space, we're creating kind of like a curriculum and toolkits that are that's going to be available and has been worked on actually by Sister Lubna and, and Sister Nandi and a few others um, uh, that formed the Black Lives Matter group um, years ago. So just really read. The second thing is more from an advocacy perspective. And I think um, this part is crucial and very, very critical. Systemic change cannot happen unless we're all participating mm. as part of that. Um, so when it comes to those calls of action from advocacy and community organizing spaces, whether it's, you know, and, and, you know so many, I, I wish I could name all the different organizations that are working on this. Math space is not alone in working on this, but when those calls come, see it as an investment in and of itself for yourself and for your community to answer those calls. Yes, you might, it might take a couple of calls for you to finally get through to your representative. You might have to take out five minutes of your time to draft an email, um, but there are specific advocacy efforts right now. One of the things that we're working on is um, the, the the those who qualify for immunity on a congressional level. Um, I kind of I can't remember the specific bill right now, um, but police officers have pretty much immunity from being prosecuted for using excessive force, right? And this is something that can make a life and a life and death difference. Um, for for the black community and for everyone else as well. I think in I forgot somewhere in in California where uh, 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 one of the um, folks from the Latino community was also shot. Native Americans are also dealing with police brutality. All communities of color are dealing with police brutality, uh, brutality, but predominantly within our African American community. So there are specific calls to action, specific legislation for us to get involved in. Um, so definitely plug into your local um, organization and follow the lead of those who are working in the advocacy and organizing space. Yeah, uh, Sister Smahan, you're very inspirational, mashallah, and it's easy for, for uh, you know, people that are not on the front lines to see your pictures on Facebook and say, mashallah, good job, keep going. Uh, you know, very honestly, right? And 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 so it really is incumbent upon all of us. It's as easy as that, guys. You know, making the phone calls. You know, if you can attend a protest, that's amazing. If you can sign on to a petition, but really making those calls, they're so effective. And really, we cannot expect to, uh, you know, uh, demand justice uh, for uh, the the um, for Black Americans. Um, and, and, and people of color and all of those that are suffering in this country, if we don't make those steps, and we will be, meet Allah at the end of the day, we'll meet Allah on the day of judgment, he will ask us, what did you do? 
right? And so that's something we have to live with. And those are something easy. We don't say somebody else will do it. You have to do it. So we follow the lead. Somebody just do it. You, you what, do what you're able to do. You're able to donate. You're able to advocate. You're able to make those calls. You're able to promote uh, education, uh, uh, so on and so forth. And, I'll, and because everything has been such so wonderfully said by uh, Dr. Hassan, Brother Malik, Sister Smahan, I'll just add on one more point is that be that advocate in your family, in the friend gathering. Dr. Hassan, you mentioned a friend said, I'm sorry for being silent when, you know, bad things have been said about uh, Black Americans. So we need to be that. You know, you hear a word that's that's racist. You hear a, a comment. You got to be, you know, I hate to say it, but you got to be the watchdog, so to speak. And, you know, be gentle. You don't you don't have to ram your family members to the ground uh, when they make a mistake, but be patient, educate them, be part of the change in your own families, in your friend gatherings. Don't allow racist comments, you know, whether it comes to marriage or color or, you know, whatever it is, uh, don't allow that to happen under your watch and be that be that uncomfortable friend sometimes says, you know, I don't like that. Don't please don't use that in front of me or don't say that or, or whatever. You know, you can find the way. But I think that's where we can also be very effective uh, in our own homes, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Thank you all for joining us and, and engaging in this conversation. You know, this has been part of one of many conversations we've been having uh, in the past two weeks uh, on a con consistent basis to educate the community and also learn ourselves. Uh, on ways to to better our community and make those uh, tangible action items. And uh, the past two months have been very busy months with uh, with with COVID nineteen and everything. Right now, we're just we're constantly on the go. But it's also a good time because we're all at home and we have a lot of time to reflect and and really think about you know how we're going to come out of this and and be better people. Uh, inshallah, if uh, Malik can um, uh, close out with a with a prayer, a dua. All right. Jazakallah uh, khairan for everyone. We ask and we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows each and every one of us to be beacons of justice and allows us to be the avenues of positive change within our society, within our communities, within our families, and within ourselves. We ask and we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps all of us safe. And we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to be the, the agents of of positive change within our communities and within our societies. Uh,